Okay, so today I have a great friend, a great uh, colleague from MSU, uh, from the CATS territory. <laughs> and uh, we actually happened to meet with the we met at the Native Land Society's meeting. We actually led a couple of field trips together in the area. And he surely is the grass, for sure grass specialist, but the good uh, plant specialist. We had Peter Lessica earlier here. So the book that I actually showed you last year of the flora of Montana, so he's a co-author in that book too, and he has several other little projects, little big projects uh, in the plant world. But just to make it official, I read just a couple of words of who Matt Levin really is, and then I will give the podium to him. So Matt Levin is a professor at Montana State University Bozeman, Department of Plant Sciences and Plant Pathology. He holds a BS and an MS from the University of Nevada, Reno, in biology and botany, as well as a PhD in botany from the University of Texas at Austin. Matt studies the effects of climate and disturbance on plant diversity in sagebrush steppe <coughs> of Western North America and in seasonally dry neotropical forests and woodlands. Besides, he's also the curator of the Montana uh, State uh, Herbarium, University Herbarium. And I didn't know about your neotropical work too much. So one day we should actually talk about it. That's great. Hi. Thank you for coming, Matt. And Thank you, Robert. Looking forward to the talk. Nice to be in view on a beautiful afternoon like this. Anyway, um, I'm going to talk about sagebrush. Uh, it's kind of a side project of mine, but I was born and raised in southern Idaho and western Wyoming, northern Nevada. Grew up Irish Catholic in Mormon country. But I fell in love with this kind of vegetation. It's, what I, it's where I go to hang out. I like sagebrush country, whether it's in Grand Teton National Park or other places in northern Nevada, southern Idaho, Mo eastern Montana that I'll show pictures of today. So I'm not a restoration person, but I know that uh, from having lived in this biome for the last 60 years, I guess, um, I understand sagebrush, and my understanding of it is not in sync with other people, with most other people's uh, knowledge or perception of sagebrush. So I thought I would just start out by showing uh, a map of Montana. And if you, uh, the, tr the conventional wisdom is, Western Montana is mountainous, and Eastern Montana is Great Plains. And this picture is a pretty standard one that comes from the. Uh, the shrub grass communities of by Mugler and Stewart that a lot of people still use. It's uh, the title of this uh, Grasslands and Shrubland Habitats of Western Montana, as if Eastern Montana is something completely different from Western Montana from a vegetation perspective. That's what you would interpret. Over here, here's a recent uh, 2015 publication on sagebrush steppe. They relegate Eastern Montana to what's called silver sagebrush, which is kind of a riparian, root sprouting type sagebrush, different from big sagebrush. So here's the conventional views. So they're conflicting, and in my opinion, very wrong about what's going on in eastern Montana. This just gives you an idea, just trying to give you an idea of how I see the sagebrush biome throughout its distribution being commonly misinterpreted. And this is just one example. So if you go to eastern Montana, whether it's in the southeast, east central. I would say there's a lot of cropland, pasture land. There's also su surviving remnants of big sagebrush. Not sil There is silver sagebrush out there, but it's going to be in the low areas where there's lots of moisture. A lot of eastern Montana where you see sagebrush remnants or sagebrush coming back in from the cropland, it's big sagebrush. In fact, Wyoming big sagebrush. So aside from the pasture land, crop land, you got uh, sagebrush habitat. Then on the hills there, you've got uh, what's called East Slope Western Pine, which is a, uh, East Slope Ponderosa Pine, which is a Rocky Mountain species, not a Great Plains species. If you know that, you might know that Ponderosa Pine from the Missouri Break Country. And then the riparian gallery sort of separating this crop sagebrush area from the Ponderosa Pine Hills in the background is a gallery forest of uh, green ash and American elm, which is really eastern deciduous forest that finds its westernmost extent in places like eastern Montana. So there's really nothing about eastern Montana to me that speaks of Great Plains vegetation. 
It's Rocky Mountain. It's Inner Mountain in terms of the sagebrush. It's Rocky Mountain in terms of the ponderosa pine habitat. It's Eastern deciduous forest in terms of the gallery forest. Or it's cropland, pasture land, agriculture. Okay, nothing about it speaks Great Plains. And if you look around eastern Montana, you can find vast expanses of Wyoming big sagebrush. If you're around Glendive, south of Malta, usually areas around the CMR National Wildlife Refuge, you can find Wyoming sagebrush that goes on for miles and miles and in pretty good condition. There's lots of uh, native bunch grasses and a diversity of native perennial forbs growing in between the shrubs there. So to me, eastern Montana is sagebrush country. It's not Great Plains country. Among other types of vegetation, it's but not Great Plains. The other perception of, of uh, sagebrush that I think is very wrong is that it's not resistant and perhaps not resilient to invasion by annual exotic grasses. And so this is a picture of Winnemucca Mountain, so just east of Reno, about 150 miles or so, is the town of Winnemucca. You drive that high Interstate 80 from Reno to Winnemucca to Battle Mountain. You're in the base, the low elevation of the Lahontan Basin. When you're in that lowest elevation portion of the, that basin, you see hills that look like this, covered in cheatgrass. It's just so I've been on that mountain to verify that it is cheatgrass and not some other grass. And most people think this is the fate of sagebrush when it's burned. And if you're not in the low basin, if you're not like at 4,000 feet or lower, when sagebrush burns in Montana, Wyoming, southeastern Idaho, northern Nevada, where it's upland, not 4,000 feet, but say 5,000 feet or higher, you get nothing but native grasses that come back in after a burn. So this is the Jarbidge Wilderness area of Elko County, adjacent Hawaii County, Idaho. So on the Nevada-Idaho border, a huge area of sagebrush Fortunately, a huge area of wilderness. That's the Jarbidge Mountains to the south. Um, so if you, this is maybe, I don't know, something like 30, 40 miles south of Twin Falls, Idaho. But, up, but upland, 5,000, 6,000 feet high. All these grasses in here, there's squirrel tail, blue bunch wheatgrass, Idaho fescue, cheatgrass. This is, was formerly sagebrush. In fact, you can find sagebrush remnants out there. You still, you've got re-sprouting sagebrush here. You've got some spiny hop sage. You've got other shrubs that also form sagebrush step, re-sprouting or having survived the fire. So there's nothing, there's no cheatgrass in this country. In fact, you'd have to ask yourself, if, if uh, sagebrush step is prone to annual exotic grass invasion, where do you see a scene like this in Montana or Wyoming or adjacent? regions around the state. You never see this in Montana, and, but sagebrush burns in Montana. Okay, so this is a perception of, um, this right here is a perception that's very geographically limited to the lowest basins in the Lahontan Basin, Bonneville Basin, Columbia Basin, and areas like that. And so I've been all over the sagebrush country, whether it's down in New Mexico, here by Farmington, here by Taos, or in southern Nevada where it abuts the Mojave here, and I've seen it in various conditions where it's pretty good condition. That's Yucca brevifolia, the Joshua tree, growing among sagebrush to show you sagebrush biome is transitioning into the Mojave biome as indicated by the Joshua tree. I've been in that kind of country when it's been completely overgrazed and decimated. And the point I'm trying to make here is I don't see cheatgrass. To me, the sagebrush biome is pretty resistant to annual grass invasion, exotic annual grass invasion. It's just that invasion happens with a, lot, with a few other things like high levels of disturbance in the lowest, hottest, driest valleys or basins. Like I mentioned, lower Snake River Plains would be another ba basin where the cheatgrass phenomenon occurs. Okay, then another perception of cheatgrass that I think is, or uh, excuse me, of a uh, sagebrush step is I commonly hear from people, God, the sagebrush is getting thick along that riparian quarter, or it's getting thick up along the aspen groves. In other words, when sagebrush vegetation is growing where there's a lot of moisture, it can get thick. But what they do is they conceptually apply that view 
or that model of the way the world works to vast expanses of sagebrush like this. This is a photograph of the of good condition sagebrush around Bannock, Montana, in Beaverhead County, so the very southwest. This sagebrush and that, it, there's not enough water to make it go thick. In fact, all the evidence is the shrub densities max out at about 30% cover. And there's a diversity of shrub species. There's more than just sagebrush in there. There's other asteraceae shrubs. There's other shrubs that belong to the goosefoot family or the amaranth family, the atriplex, the salt brushes, and so on. And in between the spaces of the shrubs, there's a big diversity of perennial native grasses and herbs or forbs. I'm going to use the word herb or forb. They're synonymous, right? Uh, when I'm speaking to mostly range people, I say forb, but a lot of people don't know that term, so I'll use herb and forb interchangeably. Okay, so sagebrush, this is most of the sagebrush biome. So just because it gets thick along your favorite riparian corridor, your favorite aspens near your, don't apply that to the vast expanses of sagebrush where the water is more limiting to plant productivity. Okay, so, that, that's, so that's kind of giving you an idea why, why I think sagebrush as a biome needs to be studied from a, at least from a plant perspective because there's so much misinformation out there about it. And a lot of my formative uh, views of sagebrush come from an ecologist, unfortunately no longer with us, an ecologist at the Idaho State University in Pocatello named J.E. Anderson. He died when he was 60 years old, so about 50, 15 years ago, right, as, right when he retired and was going to do great things. But he worked a lot in the sagebrush steppe of, south, of southern Idaho, mainly the southeast part. And he, um, two publications that he made was, this is the Idaho National Laboratory. Between Idaho Falls and Arco, Idaho, there's that uh, top secret research area that's sagebrush steppe where it's off limits to everybody for high security regions because they test bombs, they do nuclear research out there, so they want big expanses of nobody around for security reasons. And they occasionally let people like me or Jay Anderson into this area to study the sagebrush vegetation. Well, Jay Anderson had access to data from the night, so this, this area was set off limits in 1940 to cattle grazing and to basically anybody going in it. So they started recording the vegetation cover that during 1940, and then Jay Anderson continued it up, and he, this publication here looks at a, a five-year sampling of the sagebrush vegetation from 1940 to the year 2000, and basically it goes from cropland and highly overgrazed rangeland back to sagebrush steppe with a high diversity of shrubs, a high diversity of na native perennial grasses, and high diversity of native herbs or forbs. In other words, it bounced back, presumably, to what it was originally. It was resilient. And there was nothing, there was no intervention. There were no ecologists hired to, to, to re make the system rebound. It did it on its own in 50 years. And I've been to this area, and it's highly diverse. So diversity accumulated through time. The functional group diversity, the species diversity, everything about this, presumably the birds and the insects also, increased with time. And then his other study was that it, when this vegetation burns, whether it's rebounded vegetation or any vast expanse of sagebrush vegetation, the natural inclination of federal, a federal agencies to, is to drag heavy equipment in there and drill seed and, and get something in there on the cover. His, uh, his research said that that actually impedes recovery. That if sagebrush step is in good condition before the fire, it'll be in good condition the year after the fire. Now, sagebrush will be lost because sagebrush doesn't re-sprout from fire, big sagebrush. And you'll lose bird habitat. Okay, so the, I'm not saying it's a great thing, but if you want to get sagebrush back into its original condition as fast as possible, don't do any mechanical disturbance. Do as minimal physical disturbance as you can if you want to aid it along, or perhaps just leave it and let it rebound on its own. You'll get it sooner rather than later. And so with those two studies, my major question has been, well, 
what do we expect of, you know, so, so he, so Jay had this perception of sagebrush that I think was correct, but I thought, th- I got to thinking what's lacking is well, nobody studies plant diversity in sagebrush step. So I thought, well, I'm going to do it. And so far, I haven't been able to get any money to do it because nobody's interested in it. If you're not studying sage grouse and studying plants, well, plants are apparently on the low priority of funding. But I'm still continuing because it's what I like to do in my spare time. Okay? So I thought, well, what, what do we expect of plant diversity in sagebrush step? What does, quote, pristine sagebrush look like? Or sagebrush that's, that's off limits or has low le- rates of cattle livestock grazing? You know, and what would the functional group diversity look like? What, you know, what would we expect of the shrubs versus the perennial grasses, the forbs, and of the forbs, the nitrogen fixers versus the parasites? What, what should that community look like, and how diverse should it be? Okay, so that's what I set out to, to do. And I looked at were sagebrush that wasn't recently burned versus recently burned that wasn't, that wasn't associated with a road versus associated with various, various kinds of roads from two track to gravel to paved roads and highly used roads or seldom used roads. And uh, basically, if you look hard enough, you can find these great patches of sagebrush steppe that have a diversity of shrubs, a diversity of perennial grasses, and a di- diversity of forbs. And in those three, you can find the early season and the late season and the middle season. That's what I considered as sort of a, a, an approximate or a first approximation benchmark to what constituted. So in Grand Teton National Park, there's great sagebrush on the east side, on the east slope of Grand Teton. Not many people go in it, but it's off limits to grazing, so that, except for native ungulates. So what is the vegetation look like in there. Craters of the Moon National Monument is also off limits to livestock grazing. So it's native ungulate grazing. And then there's areas in the CMR National Wildlife Refuge where grazing allotments have been understocked for various reasons. So go to those places that have the high native grass forb cover in between the sagebrush cover. And then the prior mountains, if, if you look hard enough, even where there's grazing, there's always going to be an allotment or some section that's underused. And so I just find those and assess the plant diversity. Okay, so, and then what I also do is I look for the nearest overgrazed rangeland or road going through or around such vegetation and say, well, what does the plant diversity look like when there's been some disturbance? whether it's physical, like a road or overgrazing, or fire disturbance, right? So I'm always pairing sites up. Good condition, undisturbed, with something that's disturbed in close spatial proximity. And so here's the 150 sites going from this site up here is just out of Glasgow. So there's some good sagebrush, sage-grouse habitat up just uh, west of Glasgow. This, these areas here are around the CMR Refuge south of Malta. This site is by Jordan. Then a bunch in the Yellowstone Plateau area, the Idaho National Labs, um, Craters of the Moon National Monument area, and then this is the Jarbage area in northern Nevada, Elko County, which is a big wilderness area where grazing has been reduced over the last 30 years or so. Okay. So those are the study sites, and each of those dots is really not a single dot, it's a, it's a good condition sagebrush step paired up with a disturbed sagebrush step. Again, whether it's fire, road, or whatever. And a little bit about, more about the methods here was, here's a particular study area in the Idaho National Lab. So this is near Arco, Idaho, so su- central, su- southern Idaho. Um, this is the Lost River Range, if you know that area in the background. but. Basically, those, site, those dots represent 157 one-hectare transects, so 10 meters wide, one kilometer long, through homogeneous type of sagebrush step. Um, I made 20 random stops to a 10 by 10, 10 by 10 meter plot where I census the presence of all the plant species. 
and then I would sum those presences up to get a frequency. So this isn't a vegetation cover sort of study. I'm looking at, I'm trying to like assess all the little annuals, little perennials, the grasses, and give them as much weight as the big dominant shrubs to get an idea of plant diversity and the effects of disturbances on it. Okay, so I might have a, there's a high, there's a paved highway here. A green strip is where, where vegetation, where the sagebrush vegetation was totally eradicated and planted with, with um, crested wheatgrass, the grass that I happen to love. No offense to Robert, but it, my opinion of uh, crested wheatgrass, when humans create so such a uh, pressure on land, crested wheatgrass seems to thrive in that under that pressure. I mean, that that's can be a good thing. Okay, um, it's not always a good thing. So here's a transect that's by the road. Here's a green strip type of disturbance, which is pretty high level disturbance. Here's a native. Uh, not, there's no evidence of a recent burn of Wyoming big sagebrush, and then there's a 1996 and a 2010 burn. In some cases, I was able to get the year of burn. Other times, I was just able to say recently burn, burn versus not recently. So depending on the focus, whether it was the big geographical scope that I'll talk about today, it's going to be basically burned, unburned, because that's the best I can do at that scale. Okay, so let's see, I think that's it. Oh, I use what's called community phylogenetics. I'm gonna sort of not go into that in too much detail, but basically I was interested in plant functional groups like shrubs, the parasites, the nitrogen fixers. They often belong to specific taxonomic groups. So I might be interested in not just the species diversity, but I might be interested in the abundance and diversity of the nitrogen fixers or the parasites, like, like um, paintbrush and all its relatives. So by a, a community phylogenetic work, composites or brings together species diversity and functional plant diversity and puts them together as sort of one thing. And you, I hope, hope that makes sense. And of course, there's lots of, uh, I use the R package, R libraries, because R is completely wonderful. You can do all the community phylogenetics, genetic analysis, GIS, everything in one standalone uh, system. Okay, and, and also I should say here, the model is basically community composition is a function of various ecological variables, both biotic and abiotic. And I go through a traditional model selection either through machine learning and a combination of machine learning, AIC, or some sort of information criteria to choose the models that best explain the patterns of, of diversity, whether it's species or functional plant diver group diversity. Okay, okay so what, what are the results? Well, I'll just, what I've done here to, to best show the results in a simple sort of way is just to put two pictures of, of one transect versus another. So this is a transect in the Big Hole National Battlefield, Mountain Big Sagebrush. This is a transect and the Idaho National Labs, Wyoming, big sagebrush step. What do they share in common? Well, they share the family Orobanchaceae. This is a lousewort, Pedicularis contorta. I hope, forgive me for using scientific names. And this is a paintbrush species, Castilea angustifolia. They're both semi-parasitic or hemi-parasites. Sagebrush step, whether it's high elevation, wetter, or low elevation, drier, this parasitic group, Orobanchaceae, it's a family of parasites, seem to love sagebrush step type habitat. They like to be frozen in the winter and cook dry in the summer and take advantage of that. There's something about that ecology that Orobanchaceae thrives in. Okay, so that's, that's the similarity between two ecologically divergent transects, upland, lowland. Orobanchaceae seems to be very common or abundant and diverse. Differences, well, in the upland, you get, so in a mountain big sagebrush step where it's wetter, you get shrubs with the sagebrush that belong to the rose family, the rosaceae. Okay, so the, per, the bitter brush type stuff. Down low, you don't get much rosaceae. You get the kenopodiaceae type shrubs, the salt brushes and all their relatives. So you can see that's, 
a phylogenetic division, potentially different functional groups, rose shrubs versus call them lamb's quarter relative shrubs or the salt brushes. What, salt brushes like it dry, rosaceae like it wet. So that was a, that's why I'm looking at this from a phylogenetic as well as species diversity perspective to get these patterns. Also grasses, fescue grasses and blue grasses up high, down low, wheat grasses like squirrel tail and needle and thread grasses, or needle grasses like needle and thread. The needle grasses, the wheat grasses tend to be much more common where it's dry. Blue grasses and fescue grasses. So there are differences in between the good quality Wyoming and the good quality mountain big sagebrush. Upper elevation, lower elevation. And there's a phylogenetic distinction there. Rosaceae versus Kenopodiaceae. Fescue grasses versus wheat grasses and so on. Now, the interesting thing to me was, here's two transects, unburned or not recently burned, because if you see Wyoming big sagebrush step, like growing this tall, where there's nine inches of water a year, like in southern Idaho, estimates are it would take 100 years to get that tall. So you can make the assumption fairly safely to say that that hasn't burned in 100 years. This burned, when I sampled it, five years prior. What's the difference between the two in terms of species diversity and this functional? It's really not much. This was in good condition before it burned. The only difference between the two is a lack of one species or a reduction in the frequency of big sagebrush. Big sagebrush is like the only species that doesn't rebound from fire. It's taken out by fire. But occasionally you get some individuals that survive a little patch here, an individual there, that can serve to restore. In fact, that's almost always the case. But all these pens, these uh, nitrogen fixers, like these loco weeds and milk vetches and penstemons, they're in abundance before the fire, they're in abundance after the fire, the same way with the paint brushes. And one group I'd like to mention, this thing with the little bald head, those, that's a perennial buckwheats, the perennial species of Areogonum. Areogonum is like, the Orobankaceae, they love sagebrush steppe, and they're present in the uplands, the lowlands, and the burned and the unburned. They re-sprout. So fire, contrary to this exotic annual grass model of in the sagebrush steppe, for most of the sagebrush steppe, really doesn't have an effect on plant diversity. Now it does on bird diversity. That's another story, but I, that's not my expertise. And so it's an unfortunate aspect. Okay, um, what about good quality Wyoming versus overgrazed Wyoming sagebrush step? I actually, soon after I started the study, I stopped surveying these types of settings because I might as well have compared sagebrush step to the moon or to, uh, to a tropical forest. There was no similarity. When the vegetation is this short and regularly gray, spring, summer, and fall, and winter, I mean, it's a lot of the typical same five species, western wheatgrass, fringe, fringe sagebrush, um, what else is in there, needle and thread. You know, you, there's a very predictable low diversity set of plants that occur in that. Was there a cheatgrass invasion? No, there's no. There, in eastern Montana, when you see a rangeland that looks like this, that's very short, you will never see cheatgrass. Now, if you were in Boise, Idaho, where the summers are really super hot and dry, and the winters are warm and relatively warm and productive, such that a winter annual like cheatgrass can grow, then you'll get cheatgrass. But most areas of the sagebrush steppe are too cold in the winter and too, a little bit too productive in the summer to engender a lot of cheatgrass growth. Now, I, now you're, I know you're all looking at me going like, oh, I see cheatgrass all, all around the campus here. But we'll get to it at the end. And, but, but cheatgrass really, if you're just looking at the entire biome from New Mexico, Arizona, all the way up to northern Montana and southern Idaho, up into the Columbia Basin of southeastern Washington, cheatgrass, it's I don't know, it's 10, occupies 10% 10 of the biome, maybe less. 
So I didn't do much overgrazed rangeland. But what I did find most interesting was the road construction, two-track, gravel, paved roads that were going through high-quality sagebrush. To me, they were the most informative about what physical disturbance, in other words, not disturbance not related to fire, disturbance just related to tilling up the soil for a construction project. That was, to me, the most interesting. And the reason is, is because roadsides harbored a lot of plant diversity that was distinct from the high levels of plant diversity in the adjacent sagebrush steppe. You could not get that perspective in overgrazed rangeland. So I really started concentrating on roads. So I'll just point out two groups. Here's the buckwheats with these ball heads. Here's a mountain big sagebrush habitat in the Jarbage Mountains of northern Nevada. Buckwheats, um, oral bankasi, the parasite, or the semi-parasite or hemiparasite family. Here they are again, buckwheats, orobankaceae in Wyoming. These types of plants were never roadside. It was even a two-track road prohibited these from, it, so you could have a two-track road through high-quality sagebrush step. These two plant groups would be the sort of groups, they'd never be on the two-track road, they'd be in the sagebrush strip adjacent, two feet away. In contrast, cheatgrass here lying in the road outside of Bannock, Montana, right along the road, doesn't get in the sagebrush step six inches away. So that purple there is a nice line. That's, that's my most common perception of cheatgrass. It's along the road. You step one step into the sagebrush step, completely absent. Annual exotic Kenopodiaceae, or now it's called the Amaranthaceae, so all those things related to goosefoot that are imported from Russia. This is uh, halogeton in fruit. If you know halogeton, what's another one? Um, well, goosefoot. Um, a lot of these annual weedy plants, uh, uh, Salsola, Russian thistle, those plants right along the road. Super lamb's, quarter way. lamb's quarters. Yeah, that's what I keep meaning to say, not goosefoot, but. Lamb's quarter. So they're like cheatgrass, right along the road. You step off a foot into this good condition and they're not there. Zero percent present, or cover, whatever you want to call it. So there was clear distinctions. Roadside, in other words, roadsides were not really a conduit of invasion into the sagebrush step, whether it was paved, gravel, or two track. Those plants, the plants like these stayed right along the road not able to penetrate the sage rest step. In contrast, oh, well, in contrast, the, there was a lot of sagebrush plants that could make it into the roadside. So here's a scurf pea. This is a legume, so a nitrogen fixer. There's three groups of legumes, nitrogen fixers, that occupy stable sagebrush step. The genus Astragalus, which are the milk vetches and local weeds, Dahlia, which are the prairie clovers, and Pediamellum, which are the scurf peas. Hopefully those names mean something to somebody. But it's just three genera of many legumes, so they're all nitrogen fixers. It's just these three alone that can handle sagebrush step, along with the bunch grasses and the shrubs and the other herbs, native herbs. But along a road, Man, legumes are species. Most of the nitrogen fixtures is along the road. This road here, this is, an or, this is the Oregon Trail, the Goodell's Cutoff in southern Idaho, that's used probably, my estimate, I had to throw out an estimate, it's used by 12 pickup trucks a year. Hardly used at all. Here's American Vetch, another nitrogen fixing legume, right along the Oregon Trail Road. Doesn't get six inches off that road into the sagebrush step. But the scurf pea can be in the sagebrush step and make it into the road. So there's an asymmetry. The sagebrush plants get into the road, but the road plants can't get into the sagebrush step. So it, pre it presents this highly diverse roadside vegetation in, in this particular scenario I'm sampling. Okay, so that's, a, that's just pointing out one functional group and the asymmetry involved. Okay, so. That kind of gives you an idea of the, the findings I've been making. Now, I know this picture is a little bit much, but 
Remember the map that I showed of the 157 or 156 when I took out one site that was low diversity rangeland, overgrazed rangeland? Here's those sites that go from Glasgow all the way down to the Elko or Jarbage Mountains in northern Nevada. But instead of geographically arrayed, now they're arrayed by their, a combination of their functional group and species diversity composition. Okay, so here's the codes. Grand Teton National Park sites in Greater Yellowstone area, those the dark and the yellow over here. And then the Pryor Mountains, which are the lower and drier, and the upper Snake River Plains, which is the Idaho National Lab, that low elevation dry Wyoming, they're kind of all over in here. So the a model selection that are, you know, looking at the what are the ecological variables that best correlate with this array of of, our, of my sample sites, my 156 transects that are arrayed by how similar they are. Two sites close together are similar both in functional groups and species diversity. And two sites that are different like those solid blue versus these bl blue with a hole in the middle. Those are more, dis they're more different in terms of species diversity and functional group diversity. Okay. So you can see what this is showing you is that there's the mountain, the upland sagebrush, the mountain big sagebrush are over here, the lower elevation drier Wyoming are over here. So, ele so precipitation has a huge effect, apparently, on species composition, functional group composition in the sagebrush step. But also latitude and disturbance. Disturbance are those sites with the white center. So upper Snake River Plain, Good condition, solid, blue, or roadside with a yellow center. Same with Grand Teton. The solid dark is good condition. The one with the hole in the middle is a, an adjacent site that had a uh, road, it was a roadside transect. So you can see the roadside transects are all kind of down here, and the high quality sites tend to be more in the upper. Then the other thing about it is latitude. I, I wanted to put in some sort of geographic distance among sites. I wanted to include that in the model. And you can see that um, CM, the CMR National Wildlife Refuge, which is the northernmost sites, northernmost sites are kind of down here, and southernmost sites, like the uh, Jarbage Wilderness Area, are at that end. And the important point about geography or geographic distance explaining similarity between the two, between any two sample sites is that ecological theory says that, well let me put it this way, if the sagebrush steppe is being cooked for a good chunk of the year from like June through September, October, and then winter comes along, so from November through March it's frozen, so it's either cooked or frozen, and then starting in May and June, you get this short window of, of summer runoff or winter melt, and that's the growing opportunity. It represents a very small fraction of the, of the year that an immigrant can come in and establish, like cheatgrass or whatever. There's not that much opportunity. So residents, if, if, ge if geographic distance is explaining a lot of your similarity, what it means is that the recruitment at a site is from a local area. It's not biome-wide. So Idaho sites tend to look like Idaho sites, whether they're upland or lowland, because death of plants is being replaced by the species pool in Idaho. Versus eastern Montana, plants are, regardless of the ecology in eastern Montana, plants, sagebrush plants are replacing each other in that geographic area. So that's the importance of, of latitude. Okay, so from a practical standpoint, so that's ecological theory. From a practical standpoint, I can take an array like this and look at, and just focus on the Wyoming, the drier Wyoming, and look at the sites that are, are uh, high quality versus disturbed. And I can create these lists of, this is a list of species, just a small sampling of species that would come, always come from the Wyoming sagebrush in good condition. This might serve as a list for a restoration benchmark. Whereas if I take what's, what are the species that are most abundant down here that are in sagebrush country but along the roadside, that list would look like this. 
I'm not going to read the names. Um, hopefully, some of them, I'll point out one or two of them. So these, uh, because these can stand, these can tolerate disturbance and the sagebrush step. These might. The plants that are dominant down here might make good reclamation candidates. You might, if sagebrush step is highly disturbed and you want to get it back to sagebrush somehow as soon as possible, here's your candidate list because this list comes from Idaho, Wyoming, Montana. It serves as a pretty good regional pool of species candidates for benchmark for restoration versus reclamation. And so just to pick out one species. And this is a well-known species, slender wheatgrass. It's a native perennial bunch grass. It occurs throughout the sagebrush steppe and at higher elevations. But it's always associated with disturbance. And in fact, it's a well-known reclamation grass, slender wheatgrass, Agropyron trachycolum or Elemis trachycolis. This goes by a couple different scientific names, but it has one common name, slender wheatgrass. Okay, they're different cultivars. My study confirms what people already know, that yeah, this, this makes the reclamation candidate list. So I have others that could go along with this, is what I'm trying to say. Okay, so then the, I'll end, it, end my talk here with a few last slides and to address this question, what is it about certain of these grasses, like the certain, a whole bunch of needle grasses, so stipa, Relate, not needle and thread, but a lot of its close relatives. How come they can live in sagebrush steppe, but not along the roadside? Or the buckwheats, or the orobankaceae, which are the partially parasitic group. Or a lot of these, uh, not, most legumes like disturbance, but there's a certain subset like these milk vetches, and this is a stragglus ceramicus, a type of loco weed. How come it is always it and its relatives are found in stable, what I consider stable sage rest step, but never along the roadside, or rarely along the roadside. And the, my only explanation is they must have a microbial association. There must be a soil microbial community that's inherent to sage rest step, and the plants that can thrive in sage rest step are thriving there in part, not just because of aridity or whatever else. They've somehow negotiated terms with the soil microbes to live there and somehow trade carbon for nitrogen or whatever it is, or nitrogen for something else. And the reason I say that is a lot of these plants, like the buckwheats, the paintbrushes, or the paintbrush relatives, and these, some of these uh, needle grasses, they're very beautiful. They're, a lot of uh, horticulturists would love to bring them into cultivation, into to domestication, but they can't because once you dig them up or just take their seeds and grow them in anywhere, they don't respond to water and fertilizer that we give them. They, they don't know what that is, apparently. They just die. They must be negotiating their, those sorts of things with the microbes. So that's one bit of evidence. And then the other is I started this collaboration with Eric Boyd, who's a, a microbiologist and microbial ecologist at the, in the Department of Microbiology at Montana State University. And his uh, wife works for a ranch that owns property at the north end of the Bangtail Range, which is just one mile west of Wilsall. So if you go north of Livingston, Montana, the town of Wilsall, there's this, the, it's really at the north end of the Bangtail Range. It's sagebrush country. We've surveyed from this this higher upper elevation sagebrush down into that agricultural flat, sampling different elevations of sagebrush and different disturbance levels, such as near a paved road, near a two track, near. And basically, here's the, here's the sample sites of these uh, bangtail sites. They're circled, they're yellow with a dark circle. So here's one, two, three. And then these three here, here, and here have a white circle, sorry, that's a white center. That might not stand out. But basically, these are the three bangtail sites that are high quality sagebrush. Then here's the adjacent roadside. They're fitting, this is the plant data. This plant diversity, plant functional group diversity, which is arrayed in agreement with the rest of the data set for the bangtails, if we sample the soil, communities, it shows uh, from highly disturbed 
to undisturbed. Just from, or I should say from undisturbed or high quality to through high levels of disturbance. That would go from high quality to high levels of disturbance. Now unfortunately we're at a point where I'm still trying to figure out how to understand what the microbial community here is doing. Like, we're the nitrogen fixers of the microbes, we're the denitrifiers, we're the ammonia oxidizers, all that stuff that could have a bearing on nutrient cycling and the effects disturbance would have on it. All we can say is that the microbes and the plants are doing similar sorts of things with respect to physical disturbance when it comes to road construction in high quality sagebrush step. So this is an area I hope to go in the near future, depending on money and time and all that. And then the last thing I'd like to say is about cheatgrass. And um, my perception of cheatgrass has been formed by looking at sites like these from throughout the West and sagebrush country. It's very common to see along the road, here, here's a fire hydrant, no doubt uh, to keep the fire hydrant cleared, the highway crews go and they spray the heck out of the areas around the signpost, the reflector post, the the fire hydrants, and you always get cheatgrass where herbicide was over applied. Here is a mountain big sagebrush habitat right outside of Bozeman, abutting the forest. This is St. John's wort. People go ballistic over St. John's wort, so they take ATVs all over that country and spray the heck out, just blanket spray it. Of course, the St. John warts is, wart has developed resistant and all this grass you see here, there's no native herbs, there's no native grasses, it's all cheat grass. So, and there's evidence that over application of herbicide destroys the soil microbial community, such that a grass like cheat grass can, is the only one that can prosper. In that case, where actually the St. John's wort is a uh, controller, I think they would use something that would kill the forbs. But in a way, they would cause uh, disturbance, which would be again. Uh, well, you know, I get this all the time. We're applying something that's that's very specific to the plant in question. But the point, but what I always see is no native plant diversity after the spraying is done, like a year later. There's no native plant diversity. There's bare soil and the weed that you wanted to get rid of. That's the only survivor because there's resistance building up or they missed it or something or it was ineffective. But they definitely take out the native grass. I mean, this is, if you go to an area like this that doesn't have St. John's wort, where it's not grazed, it, there's a lot of diversity of grasses and forbs. So it's just where they spray that it looks like this. And so I'll end it with Yellowstone National Park. Here's the entrance of, of Yellowstone National Park town of Gardner sits here, the entrance is right here, and you drive up that canyon, up that road to Mammoth. Hopefully you recognize this. 20 years ago, this was all, well, maybe 80 to 20 years ago, this was all crested wheatgrass. And for some reason, people didn't like crested wheatgrass. I'm not gonna point any fingers here, but they decided, the National Park Service decided to eradicate crested wheatgrass. What did they get in return? They got annual false crested wheatgrass, which is this low statured exotic annual grass covering that forms almost 100% cover. There's Russian wild rye and some other things in here, but it's mostly a grass they didn't want. I mean, they turned it into basically a moonscape. I mean, I don't know how they would ever, re after this sort of, it was herbicide eradication of crested wheatgrass. What's that? <laughs> I'm, I, you know, this looks so bad, I wonder. I don't even see crested wheatgrass making its way back in years later. It, you know, it's just, I see this so much throughout the sagebrush. Whenever I see annual exotic grasses, so here's, a, here's Old Faithful. There's lots of mountain big sagebrush step in this area. Around Old Faithful, because there's a Dalmatian toad flax and another, and another toad flax species, the Park Service is very conscientious on blanket spraying all those populations. Destroys all the native plant diversity, grasses and forbs, and leaves cheatgrass. So I'll end it with this statement. Next time you see cheatgrass, don't look at cheatgrass and say, man, what an invader. What you should do is say, who is the idiot who sprayed, who over applied? 
herbicide to cause this abundance of cheatgrass with no native plants around. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you for your attention. Influenced by disturbance, and actually, what I did, I followed kind of transects from kind of a trail, which might have been or might not have been. I don't know the history of site sprayed or not, but what I saw actually confirms what you say that basically uh, you would think that cheatgrass really goes into the, the, the native grasslands, but basically, where it was like a high disturbance level of human traffic or road or something, we, we saw cheatgrass disappearing like after a couple of meters in both ranges, although actually we saw that cheatgrass was entering the native land, uh, grasslands more in the non-native range, but they did behave exactly the same way. And I yeah. don't know again the site history, whether it was great or not, it was a long trail of mainly. Well, and uh, this a study I've done on cheatgrass that would confirm what you're saying, that it's really disturbance, physical, rather yeah. than fire. Whenever cheatgrass becomes common after a fire, it's because it was common before the fire. Because it was It was common before the fire. I have never seen a case where cheatgrass was absent and then fire brought it in. Cheatgrass was always there before, which means well, it had to have got there for reasons other than fire, which is a long decades or centuries of overgrazing would be one. But again, it, it's certain ecological settings like low valleys. But Jerry. Um, did you look at, you mentioned um, that sometimes the Forest Service or BLM or whatever land management agencies seeds after a fire. Um, did you look at any of those seeded areas after a period of time to see if the natural sagebrush community actually came back in? Or I guess I don't know what seed makes it Yeah, you know, there, there are studies that, um, there are studies that have done that and have looked at, but the issue I had with them when I was ground truthing all this was they were usually in not the best quality sagebrush. They weren't in like, a, <coughs> Grand Teton National Park or the Craters of the Moon National Park. They were usually in an area that was already pretty well overgrazed. So if I could find a, a, if I could find a study area where it was good condition and they went in with drill seed, and it'd be, I would do it. But I do know this, wherever I've seen drill seed, a drill seeded rangeland sagebrush step, and you see what they put in, there's no difference between where they drill seeded and where they didn't drill seed, which indicates that what they put in maybe is not coming up. What's coming up is stuff that was already there. But that's just a relatively few observations checking out the sites that, you, that uh, I might have done to address your question. You know, they're related to your question. that are spreading the cheatgrass into these new areas? Or? Oh, um, oh, cheatgrass, you know, grasses can disperse really well on their own. They're designed with all the awns and hairs to, so I'm pretty sure it's wind, gravity, yeah, it's, and, and maybe, maybe animals too somehow, but I imagine wind does a pretty good job. Right. Yeah, have you seen any, uh, Reclamation, like mine reclamation or disturbed areas that have been successfully reclaimed or come back anywhere close to uh, an, an undisturbed st status? Or? So the Idaho National Lab would be the closest because that area was incredibly overgrazed. That, that area was in part responsible for the Taylor Grazing Act and so it was pretty decimated. Yeah, did, was, so, uh, but I haven't. Did it seeded or did it come back on its own? It came back on its own. Yeah. And, and according to Jay Anderson's work, it took about 50 years mm. of, you know, averaging 9, 10 inches of. And so that would be the issue. And also, it was left undisturbed because of the military. 
So that's the kind of, that's the level of intervention it would require, and that's not an option for most places, right? Just, but I haven't seen a, like a, a Butte area. And, I mean, it is impressive. Some of the, the tours I've done around here, it is impressive, the native plant diversity. Yes, there is alfalfa and other things. And yes, there's cheatgrass here and there. But some of those areas in Durant Canyon, there was a lot of native plant diversity in there. Yeah, that's what I actually wanted to point out, that we were at the field trip with Ridge Project stuff uh, two weeks ago, and we went out to Ramsey Flats, and actually he seeded in something that to me looks like, he, he showed us kind of an original safe land right there, and then in the Ramsey area that was mine waste 10, mm -hmm. 15 years ago, I don't know when they, they removed all the things, and now, me, that looks so nice and but it is, but it is moister. It's a, it's it a, ri it's a low riparian area, and they tend to. That's true. A dry area is just going to be inherently more difficult. So no, I, I really I haven't seen. Yeah. Uh, um, I remember in the mid or early '80s, they come in south. Like you mentioned Alcea there. Uh, actually, I'm in North Alcea in Clark County there. Uh, BLM brought in the village at helicopter and some guys, and they spent the whole summer down there just studying all the grasses down there, the plants, and the BLM. I didn't know if you were aware Around of Around Alzada. Huh? Around Alzada. Yeah. Yeah. It would have been north between like, Alzada. It'd be Alzada and up to Eco, uh, before you rise up to Ekalaka. Yeah. yeah. No, you know, I know there's, I try to read as much literature, and I know there's been a lot of stuff going on. I guess I was, I've been sort of doing this from a plant diversity perspective because it's been neglected. So even those people that go in and study grasses, it's, it's often not from that comprehensive perspective like, well, what is the distribution of the rhizomatous wheatgrasses, like western wheatgrass and thick spike? I mean, it, nobody can answer that question. Nobody knows that it's really a Montana-Wyoming phenomena. And so I'll look to those studies to see if anybody's addressed that. But it's usually it's a local consideration. And I'm looking more for the bigger, you know, what's going on sagebrush wide. And also the other thing about that part of that very southeastern, there's, there's Wyoming big sagebrush in there, but I haven't found a patch like uh, around the CMR refuge that's... And I don't even know if they took the sagebrush into consideration or they were more looking at grazing That would be my guess. Is it had they, it was more of an applied? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> timing of the study. Uh, uh, how oh. long a time period should we be looking at? Uh, I, I get this, the sense from what you've been saying that that uh, uh, looking at a long expanse of time gives you. Uh, an optimistic view of, of reclamation, and yeah, are, yeah. If are, it's, are we looking at opportunities to uh, look in the future? Uh, well, I think that being set up so that we can see in hundred years. In southern Idaho, it seems the BLM and Forest Service are they're starting to dim, lower the rates of cattle grazing and attending more to elk reintroduction or mule deer trying to maintain what the diminishing mule deer populations and because of that sagebrush step is rebounding both at the low and the upper elevation. Now in cheatgrass country like in the lower elevation of Snake River Plains it's gonna I don't know what can be done because that it gets into that irreversibility of you know you perturb the system and then given it's so hot and dry in the summer it gets knocked down to a level and that uh, droughty summer just facilitates cheatgrass. Well, it facilitates cheatgrass because cheatgrass can grow in the winter and other plants can't grow in the summer. So there's certain areas where it's a huge problem, but a lot of the biome, yes, I am optimistic because there's now a focus on mule deer, elk, sage grouse, other things for, and it's promoting this long-term view of sagebrush restoration. So there's no spring grazing, for example. Where did you see that overgrazing? That was that was some really bad overgrazing. That was eastern Montana, but you can find that's Nevada, 
Idaho. Is that on government land, private, or, or on everything? On everything. I, I would probably say it might be more likely to be private these days. Than, okay. Yeah. I, you know, I don't know that. I, a lot of times I don't look at my uh, the land ownership. Yeah. And I'm, <laughs> um, I just, I'm very opportunistic. I just go, hey, here's a patch, and I survey it and head down the road. Cheap grass grows wherever we try to grow hay. <laughs> yeah. We received the land that grass or hay bottom and stuff like that. It normally wasn't bad that you get patches of it. Yeah. I mean, cheatgrass is always going to be huge around crop fields because of the herbicide application, no matter where you are. But it's very limited in that context. And you've seen a lot of cheatgrass. Are you seeing the, uh, the spread of this uh, seed fungus on cheatgrass? Yeah, here and there. Here and there. Yeah. Yeah, not... I should mention that this study is long term. I revisit all these sites multiple years so that when I record diversity one year, I know it's, it's representative of years down the road. This isn't like a one time go in there in 2010 and be gone. I go back to. So I'm always looking for that sort of thing like, is cheatgrass more this year or the, less this year? And so that's, I factor that into the. This was a good cheatgrass year, for example, in throughout much of the sagebrush biome because of all the moisture in the Sierra Nevada and the Great Basin in southern Idaho. In fact, the only place that didn't have moisture was northeastern Montana. The rest of the biome was. Thank you. All right, thanks for your time.